Hello and welcome to Happier, a podcast where we talk about strategies and ideas for how to build happier habits into our daily lives. This week is the Happier Podcast Book Club. We love our book club and we are here to discuss The Office BFFs, Tales of The Office from Two Best Friends Who Were There by Jenna Fisher and Angela Kinsey. I'm Gretchen Rubin, a writer who studies happiness, good habits, and human nature. Once again, I am in my little home office here in New York City and joining me today from LA is my sister Elizabeth Kraft, who has heard me say, this reminds me of an episode of The Office about <laughs> one million times. That's me, Elizabeth Kraft, a TV writer and producer living in LA. And Gretch, you know, I'm all about office BFFs. I have two, I have Sarah and I have you. So I can't <laughs> wait to talk to the official office BFFs, yes. Jenna and Angela. And today is June 8th, which who knew is National Best Friends Day. And so of course, when we heard about the office BFFs, we're like we have to air this episode on National Best Friends Day. So we are so excited to get to celebrate with them. And here is a description of the book. An intimate behind the scenes, richly illustrated celebration of beloved The Office co-stars Jenna Fisher and Angela Kinsey's friendship and an insider's view of Pam Beasley, Angela Martin, and the iconic TV show featuring many of their never before seen photos. Receptionist Pam Beasley and accountant Angela Martin had very little in common when they toiled together at Scranton's Dunder Mifflin Paper Company. But in reality, the two bonded in their very first days on set and over the nine seasons of the series run, built a friendship that transcended the show and continues to this day. Sharing everything from what it was like in the early days as the show struggled to gain traction to walking their first red carpet, plus exclusive stories on the making of Miles episodes and how their life changed when they became moms, The Office BFFs is full of the same warm and friendly tone Jenna and Angela have brought to their Office Ladies podcast. Now, I love the TV show The Office. I have watched it a million times. I love their podcast, The Office Ladies podcast, which yes. I listen to. And it's so interesting to read about Hollywood, their friendship, working together behind the scenes. It's great. Yes, Gretch. Even though I work in television, I still feel like I learned so much from this book. I loved it. Excellent. Hello, Jenna. Hello, Angela. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Oh, we're so excited to be talking to you today. Thank you I'm so, so excited much. to be here. Yes, big fans. Yes, we are thrilled. And I have to mention before we dive in that, Jenna, you were on Happier in Hollywood, my other podcast, in episode 27 when your book, The Actor's Life, A Survival Guide, came out. And then since then, I think Sarah and I have recommended it at least once a month on the podcast. Almost any question that comes in, the answer is read Jenna Fisher's book, The Actor's Life. So I just want you to know that we're just getting so much out of it, even, you know, years later. Oh, my gosh, that means so much to me. I loved doing your podcast. I felt like we had such a good talk. And then we had such a good talk off the air where you gave me all kinds of advice about producing and show running and pitching. It was awesome. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad. And my gosh, you guys have gone on to create this blockbuster podcast. Congratulations. Yes. It's so good. We always say you cannot fake the dynamic, and yeah. you guys have the most amazing dynamic together. I Even though I have my sister and my best friend, I love <laughs> tuning in and hearing two best friends talking. It's just so like delightful. Thank you. Thanks so much. I mean, we certainly are having a really good time and we feel like it's just amazing that we get to rewatch the show that we're on with each other. And yeah. it's every week. It's just something I look forward to. But here's a question. And you didn't, I don't think you talked about this in the book, but it came up in the podcast that when it came to the idea of writing this book, Angela, you were very enthusiastic about her book, but Jenna, having written a book before, you had a little bit more trepidation. So how did you how did you approach that and how did you work it out? Now that you're on the you're on the triumphant end of it all, what was it like getting started? Well, there was a moment when I thought, will Jenna ever forgive me? <laughs> because <laughs> I was very naive. I just thought this was gonna be wonderful and rosy. And she was like, I don't think you're really thinking this through and how long it's gonna take us. And Jenna, what did we clock in? How many years? Three, three years and, and three years and seven months. Seven months to write the book. And 
Maybe if I knew what I do now, I wouldn't have been pushing you so hard, Jenna, but I am so glad we did it. I'm definitely glad we did it now that it has been done. Did you hear the pause? (laughs) Now. (laughs) Now. (laughs) But it's true. Early on, we were trying to discuss a way that we could work together again. We'd always wanted to do that since we were on the office together. And we were having these brainstorm sessions that involved everything from trying to do another TV show together, doing a podcast together, maybe writing a book together. And in our first brainstorm session, we did not choose book. We chose podcast from that list. Mm -hmm. And then we had that big spring cleaning of our garages. Yes. And we found all the photos and the memorabilia, and the idea of a book came up again. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of kept coming up. And then Angela had an immense enthusiasm for the idea And I was definitely a giant no, because I had written a book and I knew just how hard it is. I, the hardest thing for me is to look at a blank page and have to put something on it. I, I, it is terrifying to me. It is so difficult. I love editing. I love once anything is there and then I can move things around and add and subtract. But Angela is a writer. Angela has written before. So I think maybe that blank page was not as intimidating for her. That is so true. I I was like excited about the blank page, but the editing Mm. and moving things around and structure, Jenna's brain just naturally does that. You do that, Jenna, just like when we schedule podcasts, like she can see how things are going to come together and I can sort of see what's happening in the moment. But I was Mm. so thankful to have her for that editing process because I feel like I would have all these ideas, and then she would help give it structure. Well, I know that one of the things that you said, again, in the podcast, Angela, you said that you could be constructively and compassionately critical of each other. And I thought that was really interesting because Elizabeth and I are sisters. It's like, we know how to be critical of each other in a way that it doesn't threaten the relationship. So how did you manage that? I know you have very different work styles. Like, was it was it hard to sort of be best friends and now work partners in a whole different way? I was so encouraged by it, Jenna, really, when I look at it, when I see the place that our friendship was able to go when we became work partners, business partners, Mm. because I just trust you so much. And Mm. everything you say, I respect. And so I'm, I feel like I am, it's easier for me to receive criticism, Mm -hmm. if you call it from someone I respect, because I already respect your point of view. And I know you wouldn't be saying it unless you really felt it. And so it's easier for me to receive that. That's so well said. I feel the same way. I mean, we started as two friends who worked together at the same job, but now we are best friends who run yes. a company together. So it's, it's very, it is a very different dynamic than just working with your best friend. Because in a sense, we work for one another. We work for ourselves. Mm. We work for each other. Yeah. I do remember, Angela, there was this one time you had written something and you turned it in and you were like, what do you think? Tell me what you think. And I called you on the phone and I was like, lady, it <laughs> is not good. I am i don't know how else to say it. Wait, was it for this book it or is, for something else? It oh, was no, for no. this book. It was, it was for this book. book. I was like, it's oh, not wow. terrific. I I remember like, okay, I remember exactly what it was. When we first approached the chapter about holidays, we had this idea that maybe we needed to bring people up to speed and kind of list all the different Christmas episodes. Now, that is something that is just so tedious to me. And I wrote it as if it were a chore. It didn't have any sort of like fun. There was no joy. There was no joy. So I just sort of listed them all and gave a boring summary. And it was. It was incredibly boring. We ended up scrapping it all together, even though I had spent like four days on it. And I remember Jenna being like, I don't think it's good. And then I was like, you're right. It should go. And it was – I had to sort of (laughs) release that. But we would do that back and forth. And sometimes Jenna would write something and I would say, hey, can I run through like a little – a little color pass, like a little, a little <laughs> zhuzh pass. Oh, yes. I used to do that. I used Punch to give up. Angela my chapters, and I would say, will you put some, like, funny in it? Like, mm. zhuzh it. Give it yeah. a zhuzh. <laughs> yes. That's a great but, partnership yeah. when you yeah. can beef up each other's stuff. That's the best. Yeah, yeah I've always And to be that. fair, with Angela and the Christmas thing, part of that was just we had the wrong take on it. So yeah. when I was like, it's not great – I was also saying, I'm so sorry you spent so long on this idea that we both came up with, and we were so wrong, and 
it's super boring and I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it I cannot happens. make this turn into something interesting. But let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you, when we get to those Christmas episodes, I know a lot about them. Because she watched them I all. Because I rewatched them broke all. broke them all down yeah. for the book. Yeah. Oh, right. You know what I did, which I'm sure a ton of people are doing when they read your book, is go back and watch episodes again that you go into depth about. And I love seeing the moments and saying, okay, in that scene, they were talking about this in the background. And, oh, you know, I'm sure everyone is enjoying doing that. Yeah, it gives you a whole new level of appreciation for something that you already love. Oh, that that just yeah, makes I, me so happy because one of the things that's so thrilling for Jen and I now is people will come up to us. First of all, a fellow was walking past us on the sidewalk and he said, hey, it's the office ladies. And we oh. were like, <laughs> like, he didn't say it's, you know, Pam and Angela. It was the office yeah. ladies. And there you go. That just made me so happy. But also, people are saying to us, like, oh, did you catch at 12 minutes, 34 seconds, Joe Bennett's book is in the delivery room with Pam and Jim? And I'm like, yes, I did catch that. And I love your time code. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> You've changed the way people are talking about it. But here's a question. You guys seem to know each other so well. Did you learn anything new about each other mm. through writing the book? Were there secrets to be revealed or it was just... You already knew everything about each other. Well, I feel like I'm learning things about Angela all the time, even Ooh. still, truly. Well, you know, I think one of the things I learned with the book is I already knew creatively Jenna was better in the morning. I knew that just from working on the podcast, but I didn't understand as her friend how I needed to protect that time for her so mm. that she could be creative then. And then I'm creative at night. And I think it was this thing that we had to learn how to not only let us have our own creative times, right, Jenna? Like not, not yeah. to step on that, but then to also respect that that's when that is your time. And if I wanted to talk to her about work or something, I needed to make sure I had that window ready where I could communicate with her. But that was one of the things I think the book really crystallized for me is where we get our creative bursts, and also as her partner, how to protect her creative burst. Well, that's interesting because because it seems like there's sort of a lesson there in happiness, which is you might think like, oh, if we're best friends and we're doing this together, we should like do everything together or try to be on the same schedule. Whereas in fact, if Jenna is a real morning person and Angela is a real night person, you're much better off thinking, how do we create a schedule where both of us tap into this? Like, I, I, again, on the podcast, it was so interesting to hear you talk about how you had to get into a rhythm of even sending emails and edits to each other so you didn't feel overwhelmed by it. But I think sometimes people are like, well, why don't we all just do the same thing? Which, i.e., why don't you do it my way, which makes the most sense, <laughs> instead of realizing, let's set this up because we might be very different. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious because you guys have a best friendship that I think so many people would like to have. Yeah. Everyone is searching for that soulmate best friend. What advice do you have of how to cultivate that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like some of it is luck and timing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what you're ready for. I was ready to meet Angela. We were in our 30s, but I was lucky that we ended up at the same job. And then I was even luckier that we ended up having to sit next to one another for hours and hours and hours with time to fill. Because there's so many ways that we could have just, I don't know, like, not had our moment to connect, you know, and just, I sort of feel like the same way I do about just the luck that I met my husband at all, yeah. you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I don't think people should beat themselves up too much or think they're doing something wrong if they haven't found th that person, because I think there is a big element of luck to it. And then also just being open to the opportunity and and being willing to rise to the occasion when you do find a person. Yes, Jenna, I, I so agree with you that I feel like a lot of life is timing, you know? And mm. for me, Jenna's friendship is an investment, and it's a prized investment in my life. And I think the thing I wasn't ready for really and truly until I met Jenna, and, you know, we had a lot of friends growing up. We have other friends in our lives. We have many friendships. Yeah. But Jenna was this constant, and, you know, I've sort of said she's the anchor in the storm, and she offered me this unconditional friendship in a way that I hadn't really been offered before. And I'm just thankful that I was old enough and maybe wise enough to see that 
and to be able to say, yes, this is someone who wants to invest in me for the long haul and I want to invest right back. But like, to be fair on that, I wasn't just going around offering unconditional friendship to anyone I met. Like this was exclusive to Angela. Like I felt inspired by the person that she was and what she was putting out to meet her halfway. And I think that is a big part of our friendship is that we're always raising each other's game. Like I learned how to be a better friend and I learned how to be a best friend because she was being such a good friend. And I was like, all right, I'll meet you there. I'll see your friendship and raise you a little extra friendship. Mm. And that's kind of how we got there. Well, and you write about the moment where you, you were starting to drift apart, not because of any ill will, but just because life was getting in the way. And I can't remember which one of you was like, okay, we need to address this. Which one of you sort of, didn't you like have tea on the porch and talk about, we need to make this more of a priority. We don't want to drift apart. Well, that was pretty yeah, mutual. Was no, Jenna, it was mutual. I said to you, I was like, okay, you need, we need to talk this out. Yeah. And you were like, we do. And then you came over and you spent the whole day with me. And I was, you know, I was a new mom and putting Isabel down for a nap and giving her a little bath. And Jenna just spent the whole day. And we just, almost like we did the very first time we realized we were going to be best friends when we were on that bench in the basketball episode. We had a day like that. And you can have Mm -hmm. days like that throughout the course of your relationship as friends. It's a reset And I feel like that Mm -hmm. day was a reset. And almost the very first time we sort of told everything about our lives, we did it again because we were in a new place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And after that day, we just we just started a new chapter together. But I have to say, I feel like when I look back on that time, we could have very easily have drifted apart because we were in just very different seasons of our lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that that happens a lot in friendships. Yes. And I really hold Angela responsible for keeping our friendship because (laughs) it was like a few years before I had my son. And it was almost like I had an instant awakening and appreciation for Angela sticking with me through Mm. my just, just like I had a total unawareness of her life that must have been so frustrating to have in a friend. (laughs) I mean, yes, we had that chat on the porch. Yeah. Yes. And maybe like I got a little bit better or something at whatever, but it was still like, oh my gosh, just I was flooded with appreciation for Angela holding on to our friendship through that little season because – I, oh, my God, Ange, I must have been so annoying. Just so <laughs> annoying. You weren't. You I mean, weren't. even my even my wedding, like, I'm going to get married, and I'm, like, just throwing out just, like, times for you to bring your toddler by to do fittings with no awareness of nap yeah. times right. or the needs of a toddler <laughs> or, like, bedtime, nothing. I do remember at your wedding the thing that just I, – I have so many fond memories of your wedding, but one thing that always makes me – chuckle is that it was hitting about 10 30 p.m 11 and I was like I, I, I gotta go and you're yeah. like what <laughs> I was like <laughs> well you know it's getting late and you're like lady they're they're gonna be bringing out like like a snack like pizzas and we're gonna dance till two in the morning and I was like yeah no I can't do that anymore right, <laughs> but right, right. I will be with you in spirit because it doesn't matter what time <laughs> I go to bed Isabel wakes up at the same time every morning mm-hmm. right <laughs> and mama can't do that but she was just so like like what <laughs> Right. I wasn't right. mad though. No, I you weren't mad. Like, you were confused. You leave? This is an issue in our friendship. That's what I mean. Like yes. I was just such yeah. a dum dum. <laughs> right. That I must have just been like just so annoying because I really was. I was like, "You're what are you talking about? You're kidding." Yeah. yeah I was like, "The bluegrass band's about to play, and they're bringing yeah. out mini shakes." Yes, mini shakes. Well, That's what it was. was. You were Lady, very excited about guys. that. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> And you were like, send me a picture. I yeah. gotta go. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go. Bye-bye. I hadn't even changed into my Mrs. Kirk juicy <laughs> couture bodysuit <laughs> thing yet. I missed the whole, I had a whole I missed outfit your, your whole coming. outfit change. I know. <laughs> 
But you sent me a picture and you looked adorable. Yeah, that's right. A picture. Coming up, more with Jen and Angela, but first this ad break. Well, speaking of, we were a minute ago talking about how you both have babies and you talk in the book about being pregnant on TV, fake and for real. And Gretchen and I were wondering, which is harder, being pregnant in real life or pregnant with a fake baby bump? I know what Jenna's going to say. I 100% know Jenna's answer. Fakey pregnant. (laughs) I hated being fakey pregnant. Well, fakey pregnant is worse than real pregnant. Wow. Yes. Because real pregnant moves with you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's it's, It's part of your body. It's part of your body. But fakey pregnant just sits like a rock on top of your body. And 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 chafes. Real pregnant doesn't make you like get like a layer of sweat on your stomach that then just sort of chafes against fakey belly. You know, it's like I hated fakey pregnant. I was so grouchy. Mm. Also, nobody is nice to you when you're fakey pregnant. You're Nobody just, is no. like, you're just a pain There's in the no butt. Sympathy. Can I help you with your fakey pregnant belly? Like, no one wants to hear about it. Right. But when you're real pregnant, people dote on you. Right. So any any sort of, like, thing about being real pregnant that you might need, people want to be there for you. Interesting. That's so funny. Okay, we got a question from a listener that we have to ask. Emily says... Please, please ask Jenna and Angela which of the four tendencies they are. I listen to office ladies and constantly want to diagnose them. Okay, so Emily and I have the same guess for Jenna. So I'm going to guess. Jenna, tell me if I'm right. I guess that you're an upholder. No. (gasps) Are you a questioner? Mm. Yes. Okay. I'm a questioner. Okay. I think you're, then you're a questioner who tips to uphold her, which is what my husband is. Okay. So you're a questioner. Okay. When I read the description of questioner, I was like, yep. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So questioner who tips to uphold her, that makes perfect sense. Okay. So uh, Angela, Emily guesses that you're a rebel and I think you're either a questioner or a rebel. I don't, I'm not sure that you're a rebel. What do you, what did you get? Well, I took the test twice. Because I just wanted to make sure. I'm an obliger. And I I think I skew obliger slash rebel. Okay, Mm. maybe. Yeah. Which is fairly common, Gretchen, isn't it? Some obliger to tip to rebel. Yeah. Yeah. And obliger and questioner are the two biggest ones. So that makes sense that you're that. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Well, see, this is why you can't always tell from the outside what somebody is. You have to know how they think. I love stuff like that. I find it fascinating. And I would have thought yeah. Jenna was a questioner. We didn't compare notes, so I didn't know what she was oh, going to say. We didn't. But, yeah. Well, we don't get a need, need to get into the weeds yeah. on this. Yeah, because, yeah. But I'm fascinated by it. But, Me too. Oh, and by the way, if you want to take a quiz to find out which of the four tendencies you are, whether you're an upholder, questioner, obliged, or rebel, it's free. It's quick. Three and a half million people have taken this quiz. Jenna and Angela took the quiz. It's a fun quiz, so take that. You can take the quiz at... GretchenRubin.com slash four tendencies, F-O-U-R tendencies. So totally shifting gears. Um, one of the things that was funny in the book was talking about these award shows and kind of like behind the scenes of the award shows. So most of us do not go to award shows. Alyssa's might go to an award show. I will never go to an award show. But what is like, what's your advice for like the ordinary person who's going to like a big event? Work party. Yeah. Or- so a gala or a gala or something. You have a lot of helpful tips on how to get the most fun and glamour out of those. I think my number one piece of advice is to hang out by the bathroom. Mm. Because at some point, everyone's going to go to the bathroom, probably. <laughs> that is smart. <laughs> and it is the best spot for any looky-looing. It's great oh. people watching. Oh. If there is a line to the bathroom, you might get a little small talk chit-chat with the oh. people in line. So it's it kind of helps facilitate the chit-chat. Yeah. Well, and you two say you should have a bathroom buddy, which I thought was interesting. Yes. Well, Jenna, you know, if you go to an award show with her or any fancy shindig, she's going to make you do what we call a lap around the pool, which is just a lap mm-hmm. around the room to see who you're going to meet. I right. would always rather find a snack. Uh-huh. I'm always <laughs> wondering where really, truly where I'm going to get a little bit of a snack and my shoes. I don't walk really well in heels. So oh yeah, I don't know if it's because I'm short and I just sort of tip forward. I don't know. The heels always <laughs> are hard for me. So Jenna knows I constantly want to kick off my shoes, which means a lap to the bathroom is you need your shoes. Yeah. 
And you have your thing about walk up to someone laughing. That was a great suggestion. That's Jenna. That was That's Jenna came up. Great idea. She came up with this on the fly. She really wanted to meet Meryl Streep. She's like, oh, well, we're just going to walk up to her and like just start laughing. And I was like, at what? She goes, it doesn't matter. And I was like, I can't do this. And I literally, as we started to get close to her, I started to do a slow fade. And we have this amazing yeah. picture that a <laughs> photographer took that captured the moment. We didn't know until later, truly like days later, we found it online where I'm going like, I'm fading back like, hey, and Jenna's <laughs> right up in there. It worked. She met Meryl yeah, Streep. It worked. I did not. I met her. I just, just laughed. Mm -hmm. I was just, I don't know. And the thing is, is like, I think that that chapter gives this impression that I'm this, I don't know, outgoing person or that I have some like social confidence. But the truth is very different from that. I'm quite shy. I get very nervous in social situations. But there's something about the big gala or shindig. It feels like so surreal to be yeah. there. And I feel driven to have a great experience. And as long as Angela was with me, I would, could become very brave. Mm. So it was, a, it was like the perfect combination to create these great memories that I'll always cherish now in my life. Well, and great pictures in the book from those too. I know. It's amazing. You must have had so much fun. Talk about the treasure trove of memorabilia. I mean, I just picture like box boxes and boxes and boxes in the back of your garage. Do you all have it now cataloged? What what an amazing thing to have kept all this time. You know what was the hardest part was deciding what photos went in the book because we had so many and memorabilia. You know, we had ticket stubs. Yeah. We had props that were paper props like Dwight and Angela's wedding invitation and just so many different things. So we had to whittle that down and it was really difficult, right, Jenna? I mean, we got about 400 images in the book, but I, I kept saying, Jenna, I have this, I found this, I found this. And there was one day where Jenna was like, Ange, you have to stop. They told us no more. Right. We, can't, <laughs> we can't do any more. Yeah, it was really difficult. And I have to say, I thought I had a lot. I think Angela has three or four times more than wow. I have. I mean, just we'd go through bins and then three weeks later, she'd show up with another bin. And I would think, how is it possible that you are still finding things? Well, and then there's the digital clutter where you all are going into your email and things like there's, there's all the virtual stuff too. Now, are both of you like this with everything in your life? Or did this just happen to be some time where you were like sticking stuff in a box? I think that I had this feeling from the very beginning that this show was special. I didn't know that it would be like a big hit or anything, but I just knew that I wanted to just cherish every memory and moment. Mm. Like I just wanted to hold all of it. So there was something a little unique about it. The fact that I have so much stuff from before the show was popular or before we even knew we were going to mm -hmm. keep having jobs, I think just points to how special it was in my heart. And I just wanted to, I didn't want to let it go. So I saved everything, every clipping, everything. And I don't have that from every single project I ever worked on or every single time of my life. That's interesting. Yeah, I would say we're both prior to the office and still we are people that document things. We take mm -hmm. pictures, mm -hmm. we save things. So that was already inherently part of us. But it did. It felt like we were part of something really special and I think we both, like Jenna said, just held on to everything. Yeah, we were big journalers before and after. Did you go back to the journals when you were writing the book to sort of remember how you were feeling as the show progressed? Yeah. Yeah. I went back to journals and emails. Jenna and I now, one of the things we do with our friendship that I'm so proud of is we leave each other these voice memos every day. I know what Jenna's doing. I know what her life is like, even when we weren't able to work together and Life was taking us in different directions. I knew that she got a new Tupperware set and that delighted me or whatever it was. Yeah. And it could be something big or something small. Well, prior to having the voice memo technology, we would email each other almost like journaling out loud to one another. We would send each other a really long email about our life if we were on a plane or, you know, when we had the time to just sit down and write each other a letter. And I went to those and still for the podcast, I will look and see what we were doing that week. And it's so fun. I'm so glad that I have all of that. Well, it must be such a strange feeling. I mean, the, the office really is this cultural touch point that is extraordinary. Like, 
I'm constantly being like, this is exactly like that moment when blah, 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 blah. And I mean, I know everybody does it and there's the memes. And one of the things I like in the podcast is you'll talk about, oh, this is my big eye rolling meme. This is the one that everybody <laughs> sends me. Or, you know, this is this is one of the quotations that I hear back all the time. But it's so gigantic. It must be really interesting and almost kind of surreal or uncanny to be part of something that has just sort of grown so huge in the popular imagination. It definitely is. It definitely, like, I pinch myself. And especially now when we're re-watching mm -hmm. the show, it's, it's, I don't know, Ange, isn't it, like, a little surreal? Because I feel like I'm so watching it almost as an audience member now. Mm -hmm. And then I have to remember, like, oh, no, that's me. I'm, that's, I'm Pam. Yeah. That's so crazy. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes we're watching an episode and you're getting to enjoy it now with all these years in perspective, but your real life will come through as you were pretending mm. to be someone else. For me, that was dinner party. I was watching dinner party mm. knowing that that was the week my daughter decided to run a marathon in my belly. Like she would uh -huh. not stop kicking. And when I watch the <laughs> scenes at the dinner table, I can't separate that. I'm watching my character tell right. Dwight that she w doesn't want those beats in her mouth. But yeah. at the same time, I'm remembering Isabel kicking. And um, it's very surreal to watch it now with life perspective. And also, just every day, I'm humbled by how many people reach out to us that they watch this, they're watching it with their kids, they're watching it for their 12th time, just yeah. knowing that you were part of something that keeps bringing people comfort or bringing people together is very humbling. It's a very comforting show. I think it's because it's so cozy. It's like, my daughter always talks about things that have the safe place feeling, like it just feels cozy. And there is just something just so cozy about it. Well, and we keep wondering what you're going to do when you reach the finale of The Office, because we need more podcasts after that's done. Gretchen said that's when Mom Detectives premieres. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're certainly talking about it, Gretchen. We're trying to figure that I'm out. We're, I'm ready for it. I'm here for it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I hope we'll get to stay in the podcast space somehow. I really like it. I think, you know, it plays to our strengths, like yeah. chatting, oral storytelling. It's creatively fulfilling. I, I really, I love getting to plan episodes and chat with my best friends. So I hope we'll find a way to find other things that we can uh, break down for you each week. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe Keanu Reeves movies. Yeah. There you Not go. Game of Thrones. Not oh, Game of Thrones. Oh, come on. <laughs> Sorry. One. I tried. One game. How about we do a thing where you have to watch something like Game of Thrones that you don't want to watch, but then I'll watch something that I wouldn't, you know, like your scary stuff. Mm. This is funny. This is a funny thing about our best friendship, which is that we don't love the same shows. I know. <laughs> like we don't gravitate toward the same entertainment or like the same books or even like the same podcast necessarily. It's I'm like – you talk about, like, do you realize things about each other even now? Like, that is something that I realized from doing the podcast. I was like, oh, my gosh, we don't watch the same stuff. That's so interesting to me. Or, like, music. Like, like yeah. I'll, I'll, like, hear an album. I'm like, Jenna, you got to hear this. And she's like, I'm good. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't well, one it. of our favorite things we've done is I made Gretchen watch all of Mad Men, and then we yeah. did a bonus episode talking about it. So I think you guys are on to something with that. Yeah. Because because I resisted for like five years, I just it was too emotionally upsetting. Like I just couldn't take it. And Elizabeth's like, "You got to do it. You got to push through." And then of course I was I was like binge watching like three a night once I got into it. I bet we could have some crossover, lady. I bet we could. Well, we both love Keanu Reeves. I mean, that's well, where there, we meet well, in the middle. Then we start there. We'll have there to start there. Bill and Ted. Start with Bill and Ted. Coming up, Angela and Jenna share their try this at home tips, but first this break. So Jenna and Angela, one of the things that's very striking about the book is that you take turns writing in your own voice. So it says Angela, and then it's Angela's voice and Angela's perspective, and then Jenna, and it goes back and forth. It's a very conversational, it's very propulsive. It's it's really a fun way to share it. And actually one of our listeners emailed us and said like, oh, I love that format so much that they're using in Office BFFs. Have you and Elizabeth ever thought about doing it? And we're like, that sounds like so much fun. We got to think of something that we could write about in this way because we love your your structure. 
when you were thinking about the book, did you always think, okay, this is how we're going to do it? Or did you think about structuring a different way or, me- or trying to meld your two voices? How did you hit on that structure? It works so well. We did start by thinking we had to write it in one voice. But mm-hmm. the problem we were having was that we had different thoughts, perspectives, and memories of the same stories. Sure. And we were like, well, how do we get to both tell what's most authentic to us? Yeah. And then, Ange, I can't remember how we came up with the back and forth idea. But once we did, it was like, of course. Yeah. As soon as we did, everything made sense about the book. And all of a sudden, we knew how to write it. Mm-hmm. We'd hit some stumbling mm-hmm. blocks with like, how do we tell these stories? And I think, Jenna, what happened is we took – one event, and I forget what it was. I think it was actually the basketball episode. And you shared the moment you knew when we became best friends and you wrote that. And I shared for me, the moment I knew was in the parking lot when Steve was walking behind us and we were doing Laverne Laverne and Shirley. Shirley. And so we had these two different memories that were the moment we knew we were going to be best friends, even though they happened on the same day, right? And we both told those stories and we wanted both of them exactly as they were. And then we just started dividing up memories and writing it and it just all came together. So you would say something like, well, why don't you write about X, Y, Z, and then I'll write about this and you'll do that anecdote and I'll cover this. And then you would write. And that's kind of a list of how you and Sarah have written, right? Is you sort of divide up what who's going to cover what mm-hmm. and then go back and forth. Yeah. A perfect example is when we were talking about our first red carpet. Mm. I had this very distinct memory of Jenna inviting me and how excited I got and how I thought it was going to be very fancy And then Jenna remembered the moment she told me it was Pause for Style, which was a fashion (laughs) show for dogs, and we were going to attend. And so we would would give each other assignments. We would say, hey, you know what? I'm going to tackle the Booze Cruise episode and write down my memories. And then Jenna would write down hers. And Jenna is so great about really seeing how a chapter comes together. So we would pull that information and then put it in order. Mm -hmm. But we would also do things like, I remember with the pause for style, Angela started that. So she said, I'm going to start it and I'm going to write down my stuff. And then she would leave a space. So she would Mm. say, Jenna, she would give me a prompt, like, write your memory of this moment Mm. here. Oh. And then she would continue. And then it would be my job to kind of bridge her two paragraphs with my piece of the story. But then I might have to go back and say, hey, listen, I need to move this part of what you said a little later because I actually have more to say about that. Mm -hmm. And I think it works better in this structure. So we would give each other chapters with prompts for the other person to fill in their pieces. I mean, isn't this just classic? Because when you read it, it just seems so effortless and natural. And you're like, oh, they probably just sat down with like a tape recorder and just talked and then that's it. What more do you need? And it's like, oh, no, no, no. Nothing is more effortful than effortlessness. You know? Oh, my goodness. And that takes us right back to the beginning of what we were talking about, which was Angela saying, it'll be so easy. We'll <laughs> just be fun. write it down. I know. And me being like, it is going to be a nightmare, but okay. We're like, we're already doing the podcast. I mean, you know, we're like, yeah. we're how hard can it be? How hard can oh, it yeah. be? Well, one thing I, I do want to share with listeners is that for anyone who's interested in the entertainment business at all. This is such a great book. It's so much fun just to hear about your friendship and your memories, but also in terms of learning about working on a television show, it's just like a manual. So I also recommend reading it for that reason. For just how things work. Yes. The whole process from pilot through nine seasons. Okay, so we have to ask you for Try This at Home. We love to ask our guests if they have a Try This at Home, you know, a practical, concrete thing that people can do in their own lives to be happier, healthier, more productive, and more creative. So, Jenna, what's your Try This at Home? Well, something that makes me happier is reading for pleasure. Mm. And that was something that was not in my life for a long time. It was. And then I had kids and I could not find the space to read for pleasure. So I was going to pass along a little advice that I got from a friend of mine. Her name is Laura Tremaine. She is an avid reader. And I asked her one day, how, how do you read? How do you make the space to read? And she said, you set a timer for 15 minutes. That's it. Only 15 minutes. And you sit down with a book and you read until the timer goes off. And I thought, that's too simple. That can't possibly work. It totally, totally worked and still works to this day. 
And now I'm reading again. And I love it. I've been reading now for years. And I also go to people who are avid readers for book suggestions Mm -hmm. and also people who know me. So Mm. they know what I like. They would know my taste. And that helps me keep it up too. But I guess that's my thing is reading for pleasure. I love that. And my question, follow-up question is, when the timer goes off, do you often just keep reading? Yes. Yeah, I I do. Yeah. But the thing is, is that it's convincing myself that I have 15 minutes yes, mm-hmm. yes. to read. And I do. Every year for the last couple of years, we've challenged ourselves and listeners to do something for a time tied to the year. So we had walk 20 and 20, where we were like, we're just challenging people to walk for 20 minutes in 2020, which turned out to be very prescient, though we didn't know that. And then for 21, it was read 21 and 21, which is just read for 21 minutes, which is just very close to your 15. And people say, like, sometimes you just, once you get started, you keep going, but you sort of have to carve out something that seems manageable. So yeah, 15 minutes feels even more manageable than 21. So that's a great idea. Angela, how about you? What's your try this at home suggestion? Well, this was advice from my dad and we were very close. And I, you know, I think maybe I started doing this in a way to just honor his memory and feel close to him after he passed away. But it's become really just something that feeds my soul, which is one morning I had been running errands and I was visiting my parents and I came in and my dad was just sitting very still. And it was it, it was fairly early in the day, like around 11 a.m. And he was just sitting there and he had his eyes closed. And I said, Dad, what are you doing? And he said, I just needed to be still. I just needed to take a moment oh. and be still. And I think he had a lot on his mind. And, and I was like, okay. And he said, I find it's important for me if I can just sit and be still five, 10 minutes just to myself. So not trying to meditate or just... Just sit in silence. And and whatever that lets your mind do, you know? He wasn't a man of many words, so just sit and be still. I just took that. So I used to write to him and I'd say, Dad, I found a thinking spot where I can Mm -hmm. sit and be still. And I try to do that every day. And some days I succeed and some days I don't. But every day that I get to just sit and be still... And for me, it can just be sitting on the back porch. Sometimes I close my eyes and sometimes I just watch the wind blow through a tree. But I just sit and I quiet my thoughts and I get about five or 10 minutes. And then, you know, it's a busy household and things get moving and going. But I just find it's really important. I know we all balance a lot with work and family and there's a lot going on in the world and it's important to sit and be still and have a moment for yourself in silence. And do you try to do it at the same time every day or you just do it as the day unfolds when it makes sense? I try to do it after I take the kids to school, before Mm -hmm. I start my work day. Now, working on the podcast has been such a gift because Jenna and I set our schedules so I can Mm -hmm. make time for myself in that way. But there have been many times when I was on a set working on a film or a TV and I I'm not in control of my schedule, but I would try to find those five to 10 minutes on a break or have that moment in my trailer Mm. to just sit and be still. And that means don't look at your phone. Don't look Mm -hmm. at a device. Yeah, yeah. Don't read anything that might make your mind go somewhere else, but just sit and be still. Oh, that's such a beautiful suggestion. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. It's a wonderful book. It's a terrific podcast. I look forward to mom detectives and everything that you two will continue to create in the world. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. It was so much fun to have this conversation. As always, you can go to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, drop us an email at podcast at GretchenRubin.com or go to happiercast.com for photos, links, everything we talked about in this episode. The resources for this week, appropriately for National Best Friends Day, I want to remind everybody about my friendship jumpstart. Friendship is a huge part of a happy life. And whether you want to make new friends or strengthen existing friendships, I have collected a bunch of tips and new tools to help you jumpstart habits related to friendship. You can go to happiercast.com slash friendship. Also, 
One thing that works really well is friends acting as accountability partners. If you, especially if you're an obliger, if this is a strategy that works well for you, that is something that you can do in the Happier app. You can use the accountability partners tool to help you create that outer accountability that can be so helpful. And to learn more about the Happier app and all of the tools offered, go to thehappierapp.com. And what are we reading? Speaking of reading, Jenna was just talking about how much reading for pleasure has added to her life. Elizabeth, what are you reading? I am reading Lost and Found in Paris by Leon Dolan. How about you? I'm reading The Reason I Jump, The Inner Voice of a 13-Year-Old Boy with Autism by Naoki Higashida. Remember, whenever it is and wherever you are, there's always a book waiting for you. And that's it for this book club episode of Happier. Thank you to our guests, Jenna Fisher and Angela Kinsey. Read their book, The Office BFFs, and listen to their podcast, Office Ladies. Thanks to our executive producer, Chuck Reed, and everyone at Cadence 13. Get in touch. Gretchen's on Instagram, at Gretchen Rubin, and I'm at Elizabeth Craft. Our email address is podcast at GretchenRubin.com. I've said it once, I'll say it again. If you enjoyed the show, if you especially enjoyed this book club episode, please be sure to tell a friend. That is how most people discover our podcast. Until next week, I'm Elizabeth Kraft. And I'm Gretchen Rubin. Thanks for joining us. Onward and upward. You know what, Elizabeth? I forgot to tell Angela. Maybe my very favorite moment in the whole office is when Angela is, she has to move out of her apartment. She's been kicked out because of her cats. (laughs) And Oscar says to her, you know what? It's okay. You can come stay with me until you get on your feet. And she reaches out and just without a word, she just for a moment puts her hand on his hand. Mm. And it's one of these things where if you've been watching and you know the history of these characters, there is just so much. It's just a transcendent moment. Just that one little touch. Just you saying um, that, I get a chill. I know. It's a transcendent moment. It's so beautiful. Thank you so much for watching our podcast here on YouTube. If you enjoyed it, please hit subscribe right below the video. It really helps the channel. Thanks for watching. From the Onward Project.